Okay, so today is uh, Q&A Sunday as well, and that's when you ask Pastor Cliff questions, and he gives the answers from the Bible. So last Sunday, <clears throat> when, we, when we started our study of Romans chapter 5, I have one question that I've had for several months now, and, uh, but after last Sunday's study of Romans 5, I got four questions, <laughs> all based on Romans 5, so, uh, which is really good. So the, the, the questions are these. We're not going to do all of them today, but I wanted you to see them. So the first question is, why did Enoch not die? No. Yeah, why did Enoch not die? And, and the question number two, if death spread to all men, what happens to people living when Jesus comes back? Because they haven't died. Okay, and number three is, that if Adam didn't eat the fruit, but Eve did, would sin and death still spread to mankind? And number four, which is the, the one that I've had all along, are, are tattoos a sin? And number five, if believers are delivered from death so that they won't stay dead and have life unending, how is that any different from the non-believer? They don't stay dead and have life unending. Okay, so obviously the only difference is where they end up, but uh, how does, why is it that Paul is actually focusing on that and making such a big deal? When, the, when it appears that the, the, um, the unbeliever gets the same thing. All right, so I, I think I can answer the first four in, in the time allotted to us today, uh, but we'll have to come back to the last one. And one of the main reasons why we're coming back to five is because I haven't fully come to a conclusive answer, even for myself. It was a question that I had when I was doing the study, and um, um, I, I have a... I'll, I'll put it this way. I have a sense, although I, I can't rightly say it at this point, whether it's true or not, but I have a sense that the Bible teaches that the non-believer does not have a resurrected body in eternity. So I'll have to think on that, and uh, um, we'll come back to it, because there's another Q&A Sunday, the last Sunday of December. And so we'll look at it. All right, so let's... Let's answer question number one. Why didn't Enoch die when Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 18 says that all people die because of Adam's sin? So why didn't Enoch die? So we're going to look at a couple passages. The main passage here, of course, is, is Genesis 5, um, verse 24. And that was our scripture reading last week, which is why the question came about. Okay, so which says... Enoch walked with God, and he was not, and God took him, and God took him. So the first thing that we notice here is that, is that there's a break in the pattern in which uh, um, it was written. Because if you look at them all, going back to, to verse uh, 5, when it talks about Adam, it, it says, all of the days of Adam, Seth, Mahal, and Lau, a whole bunch of them, were, then he gives the number of years, and then they all conclude with the same phrase, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. But then when it comes to Enoch, it says, he was not, for God took him. So there, there's something different about the pattern. It's broken, which makes you focus on it and ask the question, well, what is God trying to tell us then uh, through this? So at... at um, at, at the least, I think we can deduce that God is saying that Enoch didn't die. We can't be certain by the when we just have the Old Testament Hebrew verse, but uh, I think we can deduce that God is saying that Enoch didn't die, or, or at least he didn't die like the others died. There's something different about him. Uh, everyone born after Adam died, um, which is proof to us again, which was my point in last week in, in Romans 5, is that um, uh, Adam brought sin into the world. And, uh, and having brought sin into the world, then the death, the condemnation that God said to Adam, if you, if you eat the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. That condemnation came on all of us, regardless of the fact of whether we sin or not. We die because it is the condemnation of Adam's sin. He becomes our representative. So every human person dies because Adam sinned. But for some reason here we see that Enoch didn't. So we're questioning as to why. What is it that God is trying to tell us? 
So we need to look at the two phrases in this verse. Uh, he was not, and the, sec the last phrase, God took him. Let's look at the last phrase first, God took him. What does that mean? So if, again, if you look in the, the Hebrew, um, you would discover that it's really not conclusive what this means, that God took him. Um, God took Enoch. Uh, and again, you ask the question, well, where did he take him? Um, how did he take him? Uh, and we don't know exactly at this point what he's referring to. So we can look at the uses of the, of the same verb. So it, it occurs, it is used in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 15, which says, God took the man and put him in the garden. So that, that's pretty clear. It would seem there that... Um, God took the man from the place where he created him out of the dust of the earth and moved him to the garden. So there is this idea in this verb of a change of location. So when God took him, uh, it might be it's saying that he took him from one place to another. But again, that doesn't define to us how or what the means of that is. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, it uses the same verb again, but this time it says, God took the rib out of Adam and made, created Eve out of it. So again, there's a change of location. The rib used to be in Adam, now the rib's in, in Eve. So this idea of a change of location uh, is constant. The, the verb has also been used in other places uh, to be translated to receive. And if we apply that to this text, then what it's saying is, is Enoch was not, for God received him. God received him. Okay, so now, so we can conclude, if that's correct, that uh, for Enoch at least, uh, Enoch is now Enoch is now where God is. And again, the, the verb is in the perfect tense. So in the perfect tense, it's saying it, it's an event that happened in the past. But, it, but the effect of it is continuing into the present. So in that respect, you could translate it. A really good translation, if it is in fact received, would be God took him to himself and he hasn't come back. That would be a good way of translating it into the English. So again, it isn't clear even from that um, how God took him. I mean, did he take him in death? We use that all the time when we refer to somebody dying. Oh, God took him. God took him in his sleep, right? He died in his sleep. Uh, and we apply that the same way. So again, the, the Hebrew is not really clear in, in this. Um, so the other phrase then to look at is the first phrase, he was not. What, is, what does that mean? Does that give us a clue? <clears throat> well, this is an adverb, and the adverb here, it actually means nothing or, or not. That is N-O-U-G-H-T of not, of nothing. So it's a word we don't use it very much anymore in English. Genesis 2.5 is an example of this word being used. It says, there was no man to work the ground. Literally, it, it is saying that a man not to work the ground. So it, it, it implies the verb to be, so we would translate it, man there was not to work the ground. There was not a man to work the ground. So again, the context is it's the end of the fifth day of creation, and man has not been created yet. But God has created all of the land, all of the trees, all of the flowers, and all, all of these beautiful things, and he looks at it and he says, but there's nobody to take care of it. And there's not a man to take care of it. And so uh, God creates then Adam. So the, he didn't exist. So it has this idea of not existing. Um, <clears throat> Uh, verse uh, 29 of Genesis uh, 2. Oh no, uh, we have the same verb used in the narrative of Joseph and his brothers in uh, Genesis 37. So if you jump over there, Genesis 37, if you remember, Joseph had all these dreams and uh, his brothers became really jealous. In fact, they got mad at him because he kept saying, "We're gonna, they're going to bow down to him. And, and uh, so... The brothers wanted to kill him, but Reuben, the oldest brother, he said, no, let's not kill him. Let's, let's uh, put him in, a, in, a, in this pit, uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll decide his fate later. Now, it tells us in the scripture that Reuben, Reuben did that so that he could buy uh, in the night, sneak out, and, uh, and, and get him out of the pit and set him free. 
That's what Reuben was going to do. Well, somewhere in between that, uh, the other brothers got together. I don't know where Reuben was at this time, but uh, they, they sold him to a uh, caravan of Ishmaelites who were driving through. So then look at verse 29, though. Verse 29, it says, When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not. The boy is gone. That's the verb. The boy is gone. And I, where shall I go? In other words, he's saying, The boy is not here. The boy is not in the pit. The boy cannot be found. He's disappeared. Okay? And I don't know where to look for him. I don't know where he has gone. That's, so this is the whole idea between about this, he was not. So in other words, the people at the time of Enoch, he was there, and then he wasn't. And, and he just kind of disappeared. So it doesn't, again, the, the Hebrew doesn't give us the, the, um, the means or exactly what it means. It just means he's, he's disappeared. And, uh, and God took him. And whether God took him to himself or took him to another place, um, we don't know, but that's all that the Hebrew tells us. Um, now, this Hebrew text in Genesis 5, though, does tell us something else, that there's a break in the uh, pattern of Genesis 5. And, and that is that verse 22 and 24 of chapter 5 tell us something about Enoch's relationship with God. None of the other verses say anything about the relationship with God. But Enoch does. What does it say? He walked with God. Okay? And this is important. Because it's implying here that the reason he isn't, he was not, and that God took him, is because of his faith. Because of what he believed about God. We don't know what it is he believed. But he believed. And, and for some reason, he no longer exists where he was. And he is somewhere else. Uh, and uh, if we only had the, well, if, if there's only three people in the entire Bible that are referred to as walking with God, do you know who they are? Enoch's one, Adam, and Noah, okay, okay, and Noah. It doesn't actually say that Elijah walked with God, but the use of this phrase, okay, and even with Adam, it doesn't specifically say it was, but it's implied when after he fell, it says that God came walking in the garden, and, uh, and the implication is that he, he always did that. So he had, and then he says, where are you, Adam? <laughs> like, uh, I can't find you. I've always found you here before, but I can't find you. <clears throat> all right, so, um, it, so if all we have is the Old Testament, then we cannot say for certainty what happened to Enoch, other than that, that, that he's possibly with God. He's certainly not where he, he was supposed to be, and all the people who knew him, he just sort of disappeared from them. So, of course, uh, when we come to the New Testament, uh, we get the rest of the story. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> Is the guy that used to say that? Walter Yeah. Somewhere I don't remember. Anyways, so we're going to turn to the New Testament because it quotes it. Hebrews 11.5. <clears throat> so Hebrews 11.5 says, and this is the chapter in Hebrews which, which is known as the, uh, um, the chapter of uh, my faith. brain walked out the door. Faith. faith. Yeah, it's the chapter of faith, but it's of the it's the list of those who are faithful. The, the the list of faithful by faith, Abel by faith, Enoch by faith, Abraham by faith, by faith by faith. Okay, so talking about all these people. So <clears throat> in verse five it says, "By faith Enoch was taken up." so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. God had taken him. All right, so the, the key, of course, here, because it's connected to Enoch, but it's also the key to the entire chapter, is actually verse 6. And, and verse 6 talks, tells us, when we apply it to Enoch, it's telling us that Enoch had faith in God. And God rewarded him... Uh, as he rewards all who seek him. And, and what is the reward that Enoch received? He should not see death. That he would not see death. Okay? Life unending. Okay? Everyone listed in Genesis 5 died. So where's their hope? They don't have a hope. Okay? But Enoch is, is 
uh, it has, doesn't see death. Why? Because he had faith. He walked with God. So, so the first thing that we're learning here is that, that the, the whole reason why Enoch did not die is because of his faith with God. And that's important, because even in the whole arguments in, Gen in Romans that we've been looking at, um, Paul is bringing out the fact that, that you can't go to Abraham and say you're justified, because J Abraham didn't have, a, didn't have a law to obey. He just believed God, and he was justified. So being justified is a result of faith and not by your relationship to the law. So in Romans 5.12, through the one sin of Adam, all mankind will physically die. And, and that causes us to fo focus in on Genesis 5. But through faith in Jesus Christ, all who die will be raised to life and will never die again. So it, in, in fact, it's actually more than that because it's saying that if they die, they will not stay dead. If they physically die, their bodies die if their bodies die, they will not stay dead, but will be made alive once again. Now that's not the same as Enoch, though, because Enoch didn't die. Enoch was alive, and he never died. So, so uh, where do we, how do we get it? So Enoch becomes then a, an illustration that death is not the final answer. <clears throat> God will reward those who believe and will reward it with life unending. If they died, they're not going to remain dead, but if they are alive, they will be delivered from death by resurrection or by a change. So at one moment they are, at the next moment they're not. Okay, and so we'll, we'll get this, this will come a little clearer in a moment. So, um, <clears throat> so e Enoch is this picture that um, all who walk with God, who believe in God, who have faith in God, will not die, but will be given life ending. Now, Enoch was the father of whom? Does anybody remember? Methuselah. Methuselah. Okay. And the characteristic of Methuselah is what? He's the oldest man that ever lived. And that's because God said to Methuselah when he was born, so he said it to his parents, so to Enoch, he said, Methuselah will not die until the judgment comes. Okay, and that's why he lived so long, because the judgment wasn't coming. Everybody kept looking. Okay, well, is Methuselah still alive today? Okay, there's no judgment today. We can do whatever we want. Okay, and sin, of course, abounded on, on the earth. And, uh, but the, the, the day he died, they knew, well, God's judgment was coming, and the judgment was the flood, Right? And, and so the only two people that of significance between there was Enoch, who didn't die, who was and wasn't, and then was not, and, and, but he walked with God, he had faith in God, and uh, Noah, who also walked with God. And in a sense, metaphorically speaking, Noah didn't die either because he was saved where? In the ark. So by his faith again in believing God that he would protect him in the ark, he entered the ark, and he and his family were Saved. So that's the context of it. So, but let, let's just take a look at uh, the words here of Hebrews 11:5, um, because it says the first thing it says is Enoch was taken up. Now, this is actually more interpretation than it is uh, translation again. So the the editors of the ESV had decided that that uh, they want to emphasize that he was not just taken, but that he was taken up, <laughs> uh, up to, uh, and of course they're make, making you think that heaven. But I think what they're trying to do mostly here is trying to focus on the mode that he was taken up. And uh, we start thinking of things that sh we shouldn't be thinking of in, in regards to this verse. Okay, so this verb here does not mean taken up, but it, um, it, it means uh, to transfer or to change. So by faith, Enoch was changed is the better way of translating it. Enoch was changed. Well, how does that use? So, um, it's found only six times in the entire New Testament. Uh, after Joseph died in Egypt, so you remember Joseph died in Egypt, and they decided that he didn't want his body to be buried in Egypt, but buried with his forefathers. And so, uh, when the Exodus occurred, they took his body out of Egypt and they buried him in the the tomb of Abraham. 
Okay, <clears throat> so that's what it says. They took his body. They changed his body. So there is a a transfer from Egypt to to the other burial spot. Um, uh, and so it's got this idea of transferring. The ESV uh, translates it there. Uh, or, or another verse is Galatians one six, where Paul is speaking of the how astonished he is at the Galatian Christians who would quickly change their opinion uh, about what the gospel says for Gentile Christians in relation to the law. And so in Galatians 1, 6, he says, he, he says uh, that they were quickly deserting the, the gospel which they found in Christ to follow the gospel or the false gospel uh, of the Judaizers. And again, the idea is there is that they're changing their mind, or their the the belief that they had was trans was transferred from one belief to another belief. So again, here in reference to Enoch, then it means that to be tra he is being transferred one from one place to another. But it, it's not a transfer like Philip. So in in Acts chapter um, eight, we read that Philip. Um, came across the eunuch, and then when he baptized him, it says the Spirit came on, on Philip, and he was transferred from there to a completely different city. Okay, And uh, it's the same verb, but it has this eye, but the Enoch wasn't transferred that way from one place to another place. So again, you see how this connects even with the Hebrew words that we looked at. And it wasn't like, um, wasn't like Paul. Um, either who was <clears throat> caught up in the third heaven. Okay? He was transferred or changed into, up in the third heaven but they, because he returned back to earth, but it was more like Elijah who was transferred from earth to heaven via the, the chariots, the chariot of fire, and, um, and he continues to be there even now. So again, the, um, it, it's not wrong then to say that Enoch was taken to heaven, taken up, implying heaven because he was on earth and then he was in heaven. But the verb is not talking about the manner or the mode in which he was transferred, but, uh, but of the transformation itself from one state of existence into another. So his state of being changed. It didn't, it's not talking about his location, but his, his state of being is what changed. And what changed? He was in a body that could die, and now he's in a body that cannot die. That's the change of state. So when it says Enoch was changed, that's what it means. He was there in a body that could die, but now he's in a body that cannot die. And, and, and what's the next phrase? <laughs> he was changed so that he should not see death. Uh, now, there's a little bit of a problem there because sticking the word should makes it a, sub um, a subjective verb, and, and, or not a subjective, but a subjunctive, and the subjunctive always has an aspect of doubt to it, that there's some things that we're not clear about, it. but the verb's then infinitive, and the infinitive is more certain. So what it is saying is not that he should have died, but in order that he, to not die, in order that is not there. It's just um, Enoch was changed that he will not die. See, it's a change of of um, um, of, of not of, of existence. It's a different existence now. So he was under the curse of Adam, which was all people die. But this is telling us he was changed. So that his body is no longer under that curse. And his body will not die. So if you put it in the, the language of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the mortal put on immortality. Or the perishable became imperishable. You see? It's a change of, of, uh, of substance. And, and so this is very clear. And then it says, um, catch up to where I am because I skipped a bunch of stuff here. Uh, so, it's describing for us exactly what is told to us in 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay, when, it, when it talked about on that last day, the dead in Christ will rise first. And we'll talk about that, what that means in a moment. 
And he says, but those who are still alive, they will be changed. Same verb. They will be changed. How will they be changed? Their bodies, because they're alive, their bodies which are under the curse, which had death in them, their bodies are no longer perishable, will not die. So, <clears throat> and of course, uh, it tells us there that the whole reason why uh, Enoch did not see death is because he pleased God. Again, so the application of faith. So why didn't Enoch die when all people die because of Adam's sin? Well, because Enoch was both a, the picture and the promise that death, physical death, is not the end of the story. Okay? Remember, God is trying to, to give the gospel to people in the Old Testament without, without any knowledge of Jesus or the Bible or anything else. How is he going to teach them the gospel? Well, he used Enoch as an illustration to teach the gospel. So it was one way in which God preached the gospel to old, the Old Testament people. So Enoch and, and Elijah as well, because we have this, we have, we have the this resurrection of Enoch, then the judgment of the flood. We have the resurrection of Elijah, and then we have the judgment of Babylon. We have the resurrection of Jesus, uh, which occurs at the same time as the judgment of, uh, of Israel uh, of AD 70. And then we have the promise that there is a final judgment, but just before the final judgment, a resurrection of the dead and the living in Christ. So that's the pattern that is there in the Bible. If you remember our study back in 2019 of, in uh, the book of Hebrews, um, I had a chart that actually pictured that. This is the chart, if you remember it. <laughs> Anyways, okay, so let's go to the second question. I hope that made that clear. Okay, so the second question is actually Valerie's question, and it was sort of answered in the, the first question, but Valerie was, and I love this, because it shows that our, our children, even though Caleb is writing in a book, coloring things, they're, they're listening. They know what's going on. So don't ever say that we've got to send the kids out to junior church because they don't get anything. Well, I don't speak to children. I speak the Word of God, but they get it. They understand. They get enough. So Valerie was listening, and she, said, she thought to herself, well, wait a minute. If, if death spread to all people, then, um, when Jesus, and then what's going to happen to the people who are still alive when Jesus comes back? So there was a little bit of a conflict in her mind there. So what happens to them? Do you remember asking the question, Valley? <coughs> All right. So we, we sort of saw the answer there in, uh, in Enoch, because uh, by faith, um, w w the, uh, the penalty of death is removed. All right. Um, his body was transformed. So let's take a look at a couple of verses here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> because I think Paul was anticipating the same question in 1 Corinthians 15. Because remember, the, the book that he wrote after Romans was Corinthians. And, and if he talked about, in, in Romans, he talked about <clears throat> this whole aspect of if through Adam we all die, but through Christ we all live. And the we were not only going to be delivered from death, but we would be delivered from death and not ever die. Okay, so now he's writing Corinthians, and, uh, and somebody's probably asked him this. So 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So fallen asleep means uh, those who have died. So, but Christ is the first fruit. Why is he saying that? Because Christ did die. Christ died on the cross. He was buried but then he, was, he came back to life. He was raised back to life. And uh, he's saying that, that Christ in that respect is the first fruit of many who will die and be raised back to, to life. <clears throat> and uh, um, so those who die in Christ are also going to rise like Christ. Verse 21. For as by a man came death, so that's Adam, a man has come also, the, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So that's Romans 5, 12 to 18. Verse 23, but each in his own order. 
Okay, so there's an order to this. And, and the reason why Paul emphasizes an order is exactly the same reason why he emphasized the order in 1 Thessalonians 4, because they thought that if a Christian, if a person died, then there was no longer any hope. That you, the, only, the only people that are, are going to end up in eternity are the ones that are still living when Christ returns. And it was a false doctrine, but, but this is what they were thinking. And so Paul is trying to, to correct them on that. So um, verse 23, but, in e but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. The coming there is parousia. So Christ rose from the dead first, and then when he comes, those in Christ will rise from the dead. Okay, So those who have died and yet had faith in Christ, they're going to rise from the dead. Verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay, well, this is what he's saying. He said, says believers, they, they die. Or believers that are, are living when they come, they're still in bodies that die, that are affected by our enemy, who is death. He says, but when I come, I'm going to take that curse off of them, that judgment off of them, and uh, um, they will not stay dead, or they will never die, and, uh, and then death will be totally defeated. All right, jump over to uh, chapter, to verses 50 to 54, because <clears throat> he comes back to this. In verse 50, he says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot enter inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. So now, the, what did I say? Perishable. It, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So uh, it's a parallel statement here. So flesh and blood and perishable are the same things. <clears throat> and so what he's saying is when you're in flesh and blood, okay, you and I are in flesh and blood, we're living beings here, uh, but what's the problem with us? We have the curse of death. We're going to perish. Okay? We're going to die. And, and so this body that has that curse on it cannot inherit heaven. It can't go to heaven. Because it has to die. Okay? And, uh, um, and, and it ha unless it becomes imperishable. Unless that curse of death is taken away. Okay? So bodies that die cannot go to heaven. Look at verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Okay, who's going to be changed? Okay, well, all. Yeah, all <laughs> those, those living, those people who are living in bodies that die. They're going to be changed. Okay, verse 52, they're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. Well, there it is. The dead, those, ones, those whose bodies have already died, they're going to be raised. Those bodies are going to be raised imperishable to never die again. And uh, we shall all be changed. We, the ones who are living, we're also going to be changed. Same word as, as the, the one we saw in, in earlier. Okay? Verse 51, uh, or 53. <clears throat> For this perishable body, this body that dies, must put on the imperishable become impervious to death, and this mortal body, again, the, the one that's under the curse of death, it must put on immortality. It will never die. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Do you see it all now? <laughs> all right. Another passage. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4. This is a great question, Valerie. It really helps us to focus on it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. Now, in, in verse 13, again, the context is the, they're, they're wondering to themselves, wait a minute, we know Christ is coming, and keep in mind again that the Thessalonians really believed, they, they knew Christ was coming back again. But they believed that Christ was coming back when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. That's when they believed he was coming back. And they believed it was soon. Soon and very soon. Right? And, and so they had this, but they had this concern again because somewhere somebody told them that if you die, 
you're out of luck. You have to be alive when Christ comes back in, in order to, for him to take you to be with him because you, he only can take living people. So that's the context. So they're, they're concerned about it. So verse 13 says, Now concerning those who have fallen asleep, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, so that you should not grieve as others do who have no hope. In other words, he's saying, don't worry about those who have already died. If they had believed in Christ, we have hope. And what's our hope? Verse 14. We have a hope because, and if your, your Bibles, I say, I think they say for if, or since. Okay, it's not that. It's because, because if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we, we believe that, right? We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Then God, because of Jesus, in other words, because Jesus died and rose again, he will bring to himself. Now this is another, it's controversial, but I believe that the context makes it very clear that, that he's talking about God bringing them to himself. Okay? He's going to bring those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, he's going to bring them to himself because of what, what Jesus has done. And then verse 15, for, and that could also be because, so it's the next, the other reason. So because Jesus died and rose again, God's going to bring those who died to himself, in verse 15. And because I'm declaring this as a word, a teaching that came from Jesus himself, um, a word from the Lord, that we who are still alive, we are uh, who are left up to the coming of the Lord, again, parousia, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Right? Because there is another teaching there that, that, well, okay, the living, they have all of the advantage, and uh, they're going to precede those because those that are dead have no advantage at all. He says, no, he says, we're not going to precede those who have fallen asleep. Don't worry about them. Don't, don't grieve them like the world grieves them, because we have hope. Continue on, he says, we who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep, verse 16, because the Lord himself will descend or come out from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise. Okay, the dead in Christ will rise. It's really, it's really important to note there that the, the trumpet call, the cry of God, the voice of the archangel, all of that is, is towards those who have already died. So he's now talking about, and the word rise there, the dead in Christ will rise, that means to rise up from the dead. It means to come back to life. It's the word, the same word that was used of Lazarus when Lazarus died. Jesus said to Martha, don't worry, because he will rise again. He will rise again. His body will come back to life. Okay, and she says, yeah, it'll come back at the end. He says, no, I'm not talking about the end. I'm talking about now. Okay, it's the same word that is used uh, about in Acts 9 about uh, I need... Uh, Aeneas, who was a paralytic, never walked, and uh, Peter and John came to him and said, rise and make your bed. Okay? And he rose up. He, he couldn't get up before, but now he could rise. And it's also used in Acts 9 later about Tabitha, or Dorcas, uh, as she was also known, who was dead. A little girl died. Her body physically died. And, and uh, Peter and John go in there and uh, they, they pray and it tells us that she opened her eyes and rose to her feet. Same word, rose. It is that she came back to life. Now, what's the difference here that he's talking about? The difference is, is that at the resurrection, when Christ returns, the dead come back to life never to die again. Whereas Lazarus, Aeneas, uh, Tabitha, and all the others that this is referred to, their bodies came back to life, but they did die again. Okay, the, the curse was not removed. And the focus of Paul in Thessalonians is you don't have to worry about those who have died in Christ because not only will they, their bodies come back to life, but their bodies will never die again. It will never have that curse put upon it. So verse 17 it says, Then we who are alive, who are left, we're going to be snatched up. We're, we're going to be changed. So it's, it's the picture is of a robber who goes into your house and uh, he steals things out of your house and keeps them for himself. That's, the, that's what the word snatched up means here. Is that, that Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. And he's going to come into this world. And he's going to snatch all those who are alive in Christ. And he is going to transform them 
into imperishable people. So their bodies will never die. We're going to be snatched up by the clouds, by the, by the glory of God, the very power of the same clouds that lifted Jesus from the earth into the heavens, and the portal of the heavens open, and uh, that's what's going to happen. The portal of heaven's going to open, Jesus is going to be standing there, we're going to meet him there in the air, it says to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So, Valerie, whether we have already died, or whether we're living when Jesus comes back, as long as we are in him, as long as we believe in him, have faith in him, that we are justified by Him, we will either be raised from the dead, that our bodies come back to life, to never die again, or we will bodies will be changed, never to die. I mean, does that answer your question? Yeah. Isn't that good news? Okay, isn't that great news? Yeah. yeah. That's the whole thing. And this is why... With all of this emphasis in the New Testament, I, I started questioning, well, how is that an advantage over the, over the non-believers, other than the, the final destination? Because it, it, there's so much emphasis on this, that there's got to be something different. And I started looking, and I realized, whoo, I think there is. I'm not sure at this point that, I've, that there's any other theologian that would agree with me, but that gives me caution, but it... <laughs> Uh, anyways, all right, let's, let's, let's move on to the third question, because uh, Nick is getting anxious. Wants me to get oh, yeah. it to that far point. I'm surprised you didn't start with that one. <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, so this one's not quite as, won't take me as long. Question number three, and, and this question came from Caleb, and, and Caleb was thinking about it. Remember we talked about Eve, how Eve did not have a law, so therefore she wasn't condemned? And to focus and emphasize the fact Paul is saying that, that we die not because of our sin, but we die because Adam was told, if you sin, you will die. And that curse, that curse of death, spread to all mankind. So Caleb asked, if Eve ate the fruit, and Adam didn't eat the fruit, would sin and death still have spread to mankind? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, in the argument... In the argument um, that Paul states in Romans 5, that Adam represents man, and through Adam's sin, because he there was a law, God commanded, don't eat the fruit, and Adam ate the fruit, and God said, if you eat the fruit, the punishment is you will die, so Adam ate the fruit, Adam eventually died, and all every single person after him died. Died, died, he died, he died, he died, until Enoch, who had walked with God, had faith, he didn't die. Okay? And, and, but everybody else dies. And um, so it's, it's a really good point. So um, <clears throat> verse 13 of Romans 5 says that all people sin. And it's important to realize that, that we all sin. But uh, just like Eve did, because Eve sinned, she knew that Adam had this law. She knew that God didn't want them eating that fruit. And... Uh, and she sinned, but because there was no law with a stated punishment by death, uh, verse 13 is telling us, well, those people between Adam and, and Moses, they, they can't be tried for their sin. They can't be tried in the sense of, of a punishment of death. The punishment of death cannot be applied. So it would s seem reasonable to assume that if Adam had not taken the fruit and Eve did, <laughs> Sin would still have entered the world, we would still all probably sin, but death would not spread to mankind since death was the penalty for breaking the command, and Eve did not break the command. Okay, we, we can all be deceived into sin, but deception doesn't carry a death penalty if there is no law. That's his whole point in verse 13. So. I, that leads me to ask the question that if, if, if it is possible that if the serpent had come to Adam before he came to see to Eve, would Adam have sinned? Could Adam have been deceived? I, I think Adam could not be deceived because he had the command. It's pretty simple. Don't eat that fruit. It's hard to deceive a man when there's such a clear command. 
and, and with such a clear penalty. You eat that fruit, you're going to die. They'll stop living. <clears throat> Some people sometimes argue that, well, Adam didn't understand what death was because he had never seen death before. But I think God made it pretty clear to him. Okay? I brought you into I breathed my life into you. I'll take that life back and you will not exist anymore. I mean, if you think too with Noah and the flood, God, because we talked about there was no command, right? Yeah. But people were still sinning mm -hmm. and God still dis decided mm -hmm. to destroy them. Yeah, yeah. But as a punishment for sin. As I a thought, punishment for Adam's sin. You, the flood? Yeah. Because there was no command. Right. All sin still has to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how God did it. But he did it in fulfillment of the, of the, the uh, death sentence on Adam. He just brought their death premature. Just brought it premature. Okay. So here's the question then. Was Adam and Eve... <coughs> What, was Adam with Eve when the serpent came to her? Okay. All right. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband who was with her. Who ate. So the, the next question then was, was he with her the whole time? Was he with her when the, when Satan deceived her? Did he come later? Okay. We'll turn to First Timothy chapter two verse fourteen. First Timothy two fourteen. It says Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And again, the transgressor is one who breaks the law. The law was not given to Eve. But she ended up breaking the law anyways because she was deceived in the sin. And so in that sense, she became a, a transgressor. The, the uh, literal standard version says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman, having been deceived, came into transgression. Okay, so this verse may indicate that Adam wasn't there when the serpent deceived Eve, and Adam, because Adam deliberately disobeyed. He had a simple one command. Don't eat that fruit. Adam, do not eat that fruit. You can eat all the other fruit. Don't eat that fruit. So what did he have to do to obey it? Not eat it. Okay, it's pretty clear. So would sin and death still spread to mankind if Adam didn't sin? Well, the answer seems to be that sin could, um, sin could spread to mankind, but not death. Uh, because death came as the punishment through Adam for his disobedience. It, it, it's, again, <clears throat> death comes through Adam in exactly the same way that life comes through Jesus. We cannot earn our salvation. It comes through faith. We do not earn death through our own sin, but it was our condemnation through Adam. We can't get life from anyone else, and it's, so it's reasonable to assume that we cannot die that we can that we can die because of someone else. We don't necessarily always understand that, but it's actually, as I mentioned last time, is it's actually an act of God's grace that He did this way. That Adam represents us and Jesus represents us. Alright, so it comes to the, the the fourth question, are tattoos a sin? And this one's gonna be a really easy one to answer. Nope. All right, so <laughs> I mean, it wasn't quite my question. There was, no. a, lot, there was a lot more to it. it was but that what he said was what Nick said to me. He says, I, I found Leviticus 19.28 to be interesting. Are tattoos still a sin or were they ever? Has this been fulfilled on the cross or should this be followed? Those are your exact words. And then I went into the piercing, and does it disappear once you go to heaven, or does it stay? Yeah, okay, so it, it really is a good question, and a lot of people have it. And a lot of people have it because they are confused uh, about the, the two covenants. And, and, and I'll make this statement, and, and covenantalists will not like me saying this, but it's true. If you call yourself a covenantalist that we are under the old covenant, then you're under the old covenant. So therefore, this would be a sin if you got a tattoo. 
in the exact same way that trimming your beard, trimming your sideburns, or cutting your hair differently, or wearing a cotton blend shirt, all those things would be sin under the old covenant. So don't tell me you're a covenantalist. All right, so come back to this. All right, we, we, we know that this is part of the old covenant. And again, we are not under that old covenant, so there is a sense in which we can dismiss it by simply that. But here's the problem. We don't dismiss anything just simply because we're not under that old law. Because there's lots of laws in the old covenant that would be morally correct for us to obey in the new covenant. Right? And, and, and so there, there are... So we cannot just dismiss it. We've got to look at, well, what exactly is it that God is saying? And what is the context of it? Do we disqualify it simply because we're not under the law? No, I don't think so. Um, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of the covenantists look at us uh, as New Covenant theologians, theology, and they say, well, you don't believe in any law at all. You don't have any law. You're antinomian. You're against the law. And that's, that's not true. We're not saying that at all. We, we have the law of God written in our hearts. We intuitively know what is right and what is wrong, what is moral, what is immoral. Okay? We, we don't have to have laws that, that, that really don't have to do with anything. And so much of the laws of Israel had nothing to do with nothing except that they were laws just like God said to Adam, don't eat that fruit. Why? What's wrong with that fruit? There's nothing wrong with that fruit. I created it. It was great. But don't eat it. Well, why not? Because I said so. That's the simplicity of it. And it's the same with a whole bunch of the laws of the Old Covenant. What do you mean i got to trim my beard in a certain way? Or I can't trim my sideburns? That's, that's just ridiculous. Well, I said don't, so don't. See, that's what it's all about. You see, under the New Covenant, we don't live under that situation anymore. But we don't need a law written down that says, do not covet your... your do not covet, because we know that coveting is wrong, intuitively, you understand? All right, so uh, there's lots of exhortations in the New Testament, of course, that we could write down in this, as established laws for living as believers. Um, um, and um, some people call this the law of Christ, and, and uh, other people call it different things, but those are there. And certainly we know that many of those old covenant laws certainly describe what a Christian should look like in this world. So to dismiss something just because it's under the old covenant law certainly is, uh, seems to be more of an excuse, I think, than it is a desire to be holy. So you somebody say, you say the same thing about murder. Yeah, you can. Yeah, exactly the same thing about murder. Okay. But a guy who really wants a, a guy who really wants to have a, a, a tattoo, or even a guy that's that uh, had a whole bunch of tattoos and becomes a Christian, maybe starting to feel guilty about. It, on all the tattoos, he might say, well, look, that's under the law, I'm not under the law, so I don't have to feel guilty anymore. Right? Well, that's not a valid reason, is what I'm trying to say. We are to be separate from the world, we are to act different, we are to look different, right? Would you all agree with that? Okay, so but how does that translate into what we do? So we, we have to remember that the Old Covenant again was given to Israel for a specific purpose. And that purpose was to prove to them that they cannot keep a law. That there's no difference between them and Adam and all the Gentiles who they say are lawbreakers. They, he says, no, there's no difference at all between you and anybody else. We're all lawbreakers if there was a law. Okay? And just to prove it to you, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of real simple ones. Just take the Ten Commandments. They're really simple. They're easy to keep. Don't make an image. Don't make an image of an idol. What's hard about that? Don't carve a piece of wood and worship it. It's pretty easy, right? But anyways, um, so we can't, they can't blame Adam anymore. They can't blame the, the Gentiles. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what the Old Covenant is saying. And uh, we'll do this fairly quickly. So if you turn to the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 19 is where the, the verse is. Did I put it there? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> again, in the book of Leviticus, there are six over 600 different laws. There are different commands that, that God put, put on them, all about all kinds of different things. Okay, there are laws about eating blood. There's laws about 
sexual relationships, there's laws about bodily discharges, laws about sickness, laws about disease, laws about sacrifices, laws about eating, laws about what clothes to wear, laws about uh, all kinds of things here. Uh, and again, it, it is to make them distinct from all the other nations, but not to make them distinct as being holy in that they, these things make you righteous, which is what the Jews all believe, right? All the Jews believe if they keep all these things, they'll be righteous. And he says, no, that's not the, the point is, is that you can't even keep these laws. And uh, you, you need. So, so when we come to Leviticus 19, we come to the, another whole group of laws in this long list of laws. So look at verse 17. It says, you shall not round off the hair on your temples. Okay, okay this, so when you see the Orthodox Jews, they have these ringlets here and they're because they, they can't cut this hair that's here. And that's how they interpret it. And uh, uh, nor mar the edges of your beard. Okay, don't cut your beard. Don't you dip. So he's cutting it as a marring, it says. I don't know how that is. You shall not make any cuts, verse 28, which is the verse we're looking at. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Verse 29 says, don't make your daughters into a prostitute. Verse 30 says, keep the Sabbath and reverence the sanctuary. Verse 31 um, says don't consult a medium. And I, and I really like 32. I think we should bring this one back. It says you should stand up when a gray-haired man comes into the room. <laughs> and, and, and honor the face of an old man. See, that would make me feel really good. Make you feel real good. Too, right? See, all, all of these commands, you see, are, are all straightforward, easy things to do. Just like the one that's given to Adam. Adam, don't eat the fruit of the tree. Remember? So I'm focusing on this because this was God's point. These do not make you holy. These, some make sense and some don't make sense. It doesn't matter if you think it's a dumb rule. You have to do it because God said it. Okay? And God doesn't put that on us in the new covenant. Because he doesn't have to prove to us that we need a savior. Because we have come to the savior. That's why we're in the New Covenant, because we have come to, to the end of our rope, spiritually speaking, and we know that our only hope is, is in Christ. I cannot earn my salvation. I can't, don't deserve salvation, but it's in Jesus. So look at verse 28. So you shall make, not make any cuts in your body for the dead or tattoo your, yourselves. Now, it's unfortunate that they said tattoo, because tattoos did not exist until the 1700s. The word did not exist before that time. So, so right then and there, you know that, that it's not talking about a tattoo. Now, we know that specifically a tattoo is inserting ink under the skin uh, to make a permanent mark. That's what a tattoo is, right? So is that what it's talking about? So it's possible that they did that, but we it, it, it's it's... It's hard to say. So let's take a look at this. The noun that's translated the tattoo actually means mark or carve out, to carve out. So it's definitely not a putting ink under the skin, but it's a carving out. So the, the word, um, and this is the only place in the entire Bible where this word occurs. So it, it's got a usage that is lost, so we can't be 100% certain of this. And so we look to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, and say, well, what word did they use? Well, they used the word, uh, the Greek word, which is grammata. Uh, gramma sounds like grammar, right? Okay, and gra grammata is talking about words or writings, and, uh, and it's, it's also possibly used of talking about graffiti. So, uh, so in that sense, the Greeks reading, translating this said, uh, was talking about putting writings on your skin or putting graffiti uh, on your skin. But uh, the word cuts uh, that's in this verse is actually um, would be better translated writing. So it refers to inscribed or engraved symbols or words. And again, it's only used in this text. Oh, uh, I think that right. the uh, <laughs> power surge. Okay. There we go. All right. So um, we lost the computer. Oh, yeah. uh, probably just have to turn the TV on again. <coughs> All right. Oh yeah, 
Okay, so a, a good literal translation, is it there? Yes. Okay. So a good literal translation of this would be this. You shall not make any cuttings for the dead on your body, nor make any carvings on yourself. Okay, that would be a, a better way of translating it. Would, so, would, would that be also for the dead? Well, it is specifically the cuttings for the dead. Uh, because this is what they did as part of their mourning process, they would cut themselves. You know, uh, you know, even in our own society, we have uh, particularly teenage girls. They like to cut themselves. They raise their base and make all these cut marks. They, that's the kind of thing it's talking about. Because they specifically did did that in the way that they mourn for for their dead. Uh, we'll actually come to an example of this. So to move on here. Um, the reality of the verse is that it probably has nothing to do with tattoos at all, with putting ink under the skin, although we could draw a correlation to that, because a cat tattoo is, in fact, a permanent marking of your skin. So the background, again, is that, uh, again, this is a law to Israel to make them distinct from all of the other nations, but, but more than that, to, to make them obey just a command that God has given them, to prove to them that they can't keep it. Um, so uh, the Egyptians, it is, archaeologists have shown, have found that, that Egyptians like to draw images um, of, uh, on the bodies of women, particularly on their breasts, on their, on their stomachs, because they thought it gave them good luck in childbearing, okay, and, and would take away the uh, pain and so forth. So, so there was, there was um, superstition applied to it. And so they just came out of Egypt, right? And he says, well, don't be like them, okay? I don't want to do that kind of stuff. Um, and, and also the Canaanites, because when they came into the Promised Land, the first group of people they met were the Canaanites. And the Canaanites, they actually did mark their body with, with uh, some kind of ink uh, or drawing. Or, um, and, and, but their, theirs was more extreme. Um, theirs was actually scarification measures. They would, they would brand their skin. They would slash their skin. Um, um, they would gash the skin open. Uh, the archaeology backed by biblical texts, I'm quoting from somebody here, indicates the Canaanites would customarily slash their bodies for ritualistic purposes, especially to mourn their dead or to honor their gods. And of course, when you read 1 Kings chapter 18, okay, the, the, the Jews there were influenced by, the, um, by um, Jezebel and the, the Canaanite worship. And so what did Elijah say? He says, look, he says, says, you pray to your God to bring down fire, and I'll pray to my God. And they're praying to the God, and nothing's happening. And Elijah taunts them, pray louder. And so they pray louder. And uh, before you know it, they're in this frenzy, they're cutting themselves and, and bleeding. And, they're, and it's all written there for us. So we can see they're trying to get their God. Look at God, I, I'm even cutting myself. You can come and bring the fire. It doesn't work that way because their God is dead. So Leviticus 19.28 seems to really imply this when it says you will not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead nor print marks on you. In light of this information from Egypt and Canaan, it would seem that God was forbidding scarification specifically and not tattooing directly okay, um, in terms of the law. But again, the law is not there. So, uh, and, and uh, so... With that said, um, what do we do as Christians today? Because uh, we know scarring our skin, cutting our skin is wrong. We know that's wrong. We know that instinctively. Okay? So, but for some reason, we don't all know that about tattooing. Now, I would say that I would never get a tattoo. Uh, and I would never get it for, I think, for several reasons. Um, I can't say that okay, this is my reasons. I can't say that these should be your reasons. Because the Bible doesn't say anything about it, but the Bible does talk about other things, right? So, it, so I think there are many, there are lots of clear passages where the Bible uh, addresses uh, what we should be, how we should be in this world, how we should dress. It talks about modesty. It talks about all kinds of different things. Uh, it talks about um, how we do things and what we do. Uh, for instance, in Corinthians, it talks about uh, the, the eating of meat that's been sacrificed to, to, um, to uh, idols. He says, we, in, in our freedom in Christ, we can eat the meat because it's not going to affect us. It doesn't have any effect on us at all. 
It's about a weaker Christian who's just come out of that. He might have a problem with it, so don't stumble them. Don't, don't cause them to stumble. So those are, those are other principles. We don't, with what, what, are we, what am I, I am doing? Is this going to cause somebody else to, to, to stumble and uh, think differently? So these are things that, that I use to, to, to guide my, my thoughts. Um, uh, find where I am here. I, I think there's a, there's a common sense advice as Christians that we need to do. And, and the first thing would be think before you ink. <laughs> wow! Uh, I didn't coin that, but I liked it. Think before you ink, and there's reasons for it. Um, um, there's lots of considerations. Ha! Oh. Okay. Computer froze too. Considerations. Okay. Other co things to consider. Think before you eat. Okay, our bodies are told. We're told are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I can't say that that means you should never put a tattoo or a permanent mark on you, but something to think about. Okay, our, our bodies are the creation of God. God created us. Uh, our skin is beautiful. Okay? Uh, psychologists have, uh, worldly psychologists have have all kinds of articles of how beautiful men see the skin of women but how ugly they see the skin of women that have tattoos on them so that's just an interesting thing um, I, and I'm, I have to say that when I see a, a woman that has a tattoo I think it's ugly <laughs> anyways um, um, uh, um, it could limit our employment there are employers who will not hire if you've got visible tattoos um, there's also me medical concerns from the Mayo Clinic. They warn of allergic reactions, scars, bloodborne diseases like hepatitis B and C. All of so think before before you you um, ink. <clears throat> so what's uh, what's the difference between a piercing and a tattoo? Because then people still get allergic to the piercings and the material, but then it's still scarring and it's yeah, still. Yeah, it's the same thing. So. You, you, your generation probably don't know the, the difference between the earrings. Okay? It used to be that men never wore earrings, right? But then, if you wore, if a man wore an earring in his left ear, it means I'm gay. I thought it was right. No, it's right. It's right right, 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 right ear, big. I know it's wrong. Put it in his right ear, it means I'm gay. Put it in both ears, it means I'm both. Okay, so, I don't know about those. But anyways, there was a stigma to it, and now the stigma is gone. But again, just think before you, you do those kinds of things. And the same with, with piercings. You think about it. Okay? And um, think about, did, did you know there, that, did, you know the tattoo that you put on your lower back, right in this area? You know, the girls wear those low riding jeans, and they have this tattoo that's there. Well, it was a, a trend about 20 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not really. A they're called a tramp stamps. Tramp stamps. Okay. <laughs> because it, it's telling men, I'm a tramp. You know what that means, okay? <laughs> now, it, it, um, it has gone away, but it hasn't completely gone away. But the whole thing is, if you're a Christian, do you, do you really want that possible stigma? I, I don't know. Things to think about. John Piper gives us six um, things to think about. This is how he counsels Christians about against getting a tattoo. So I don't know that I would counsel you against it, but number one, we should adorn ourselves to give glory to God. Tattoos focus on external adornment. Uh, number two, tattoos are permanent, and he says that because of per some people regret it they, they, later when, in later life, and also when your skin begins to sag, some of those really nice, pretty ones uh, begin to change shape and no longer. Uh, anyways, number three, you and your culture change. Uh, so, so just as, as the, the um, tram stamps are no longer tram stamps, but it's still there because our culture changed it. Just because culture says now it's good doesn't mean that the connotation is there. Tattoos taint the skin. In general, they're ugly. Five tattoos do not offer timeless Christian branding. Um, 
Uh, we just, a lot of Christians say, well, I'm going to get it because I can, I can put a scripture verse on it. I can put a cross on it. And, and people, can, you look at all the sports guys, every sports guy, hockey or football or basketball especially, but they all do it. And you see all these guys with, with they got the three crosses and the, you know, I, I, I'm watching the World Series and, and, uh, and, and uh, they all, every single one, when they run the bases and they get a home run and they're coming through, as soon as they get past third bases, they cross themselves and point up to God and, and, and because they're, they're trying to show that they're religious. And these tattoos are saying, I'm religious. But the problem is those tattoos are, are saying, I'm religious, but I'm not saved. And so it's, 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 Christian branding is, what brands us as a Christian is our life. Is our life. Exactly. And number six, tattoos are missionally limiting. Okay, you cannot minister in a Muslim country if you've got tattoos. They will not accept you. So, and a lot of people do that. They say, well, if I have tattoos, I can go into the bars and I can, I can uh, witness. Well, do you? <laughs> okay, a lot of them don't. Just, they just think that they do. So, think before you eat. That's the thing, and, and be cautious. All right. Well, that definitely you want to... I hope that answers your question, Nick. Okay.